Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. You doing well? Am I doing okay today? How many of you want to be in Alaska with our, our mission trip right now? Got a picture from those guys uh, from, uh, from the airport in a place called Bethel. And the, the two things stood out to me. Number one was the huge moose in the picture behind them. Not a real moose, just a stuffed moose, I'm assuming. Could have been walking through the airport. Um, the other was that they were all wearing jackets. When was the last time you put on a jacket? It's been a while. If, you're living, if you live in San Antonio, you know that that's not something you do often. But, but today I'm going to talk to you about the mission trip that another group took that was not to Alaska. We went the other direction to South Texas. But let's, let's take just a moment and let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For it is in the name of your Son, our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. You know, a little over a week ago, I had the tremendous joy and privilege to travel to the Rio Grande Valley to serve on a mission team with some of your sons and daughters with our middle schoolers. i got to tell you, I wasn't sure what this trip was going to be like. I am now a senior pastor. I have been a senior pastor now for about 17 years. I used to not have, I haven't actually had to do the middle school mission trips in quite some time. So this is probably my first middle school mission trip in 15 years. And you know what? It was awesome. I would recommend every, uh, every one of you, every one of you adults sign up for that in the years to come if you get a chance, especially if you could go with this group of, of young people that we went. First of all, that, that we accompanied. First of all, I want to I want to thank our, our leaders. I want to thank particularly Emily and Becky. Emily Yergler over here and Becky Pritchard. Let's give them a hand for... <laughs> this was seriously one of the, the best, uh, one of the best student mission trips on which I've ever served, of which I've ever participated. It was just really wonderful. And I, that, goes, that goes to the credit of Emily and Becky. It, you know, but it's funny, when you're on a mission trip with people, you learn things about them that you didn't know, especially when you spend a lot of time in vans. Um, uh, if you've never heard Becky sing the seatbelt song... Um, you know, you, you, you have missed something, and, and if, you do, if you hear her sing it, you, you will have a whole new attitude about safety in the car. You'll put your seatbelt on just to make sure she stops singing it. Um, but another thing I also learned, it's, it's not just that. It's, it's that you know, every van driver, every, every youth leader has their own kind of, their own shtick, their own, their own package of things they work up, and, and part of that is the music you listen to in the van. Let me give you a, a comparison. Becky is all classic rock. The, the van came wheeling into the house one night, and the kids were just screaming queen at the top of their lungs. And then on the other hand, you've got Emily, who is a summer country music girl. I don't know, I don't know if, if this is something that she listens to all year round, but every song is about going to some party on the river. If you've got a boat, please take this girl to the lake. Take, do some. She wants to go so badly right now. But our others, Julie Walthall, who was, uh, who was with us, Doug Rule, and then me, we, we had a great team of leaders. But, but most of all, we had an outstanding group of middle schoolers. I mean, this, and high schoolers. We had some high school helpers. I mean, Patrick and Lily, Margaret and Kate, Kate and Annie, Jake and Tyler, Maddie and Tucker and Margaret and Abby and Grace and Abigail. Y'all, this is an outstanding group of young people. And I want, I'm, I am not lying to you. I mean, yes, we were all living together in about a thousand square foot house. We were sleeping in the hallways and the kitchen and the bedrooms, the dining room, everywhere but the bathrooms. And, you know, of course, you're living in that kind of close quarters. There's going to be a little friction every now and then. But I want to tell you, when we got out to the work sites and when we were with people, these kids were an outstanding witness, not only for First Presbyterian Church, but also for the Church of Jesus Christ. And I just want to thank you all. And wherever, I know they're all over the room. Let's, let's give them a hand. What an outstanding group of kids. So anyway, I, I wanted to say that, but let me tell you a little bit about the trip. We, we left the church here and, uh, after church, and we drove down to McAllen on Sunday afternoon. 
And I just need you to understand that the heat index that day was 121 degrees Fahrenheit in McAllen, and it seemed most of the way there. Now, we were meeting with a group, we were serving with a group called Experience Mission. And when we finally arrived in the little town of Far, Texas, which is next to McAllen, I'm just learning all this, I'm new to the area, um, we met our, our mission partner and representative, a young woman named Mina Hoya, who was our director and guide for the week, our partner for the week. And we, we met at our rally point, our, our transportation rally point was this building supply store and we met there, and then she said, well, we're going, to, we're going to begin our mission experience with worship at her father's church. Her father is a pastor in FAR. And, you know, I, I was standing there in this building supply lot looking around thinking, okay, so where's the church? So where is the church? She says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you down to the church. And I, I was looking for it. I didn't see it. All I saw was this building supply store. I saw a body shop, a tire store, and this little Mexican restaurant. I was like, Wait, so where's the church? So anyway, so she just starts walking, and we like good little ducks all just started following her down the street. And then I realized I'd forgotten my Bible. So I ran back to the car, and I got the Bible, and I turned around. I closed the door. I turned around, and the group was gone. 20 people just disappeared. It was like the rapture happened, and I got left behind. <laughs> They were just gone. And I, and I was looking, and so yeah, I kind of did that thing where I'm walking a little faster, and then I double back a little bit, and then I walk a little faster, and, I'm done. and then I kind of break into that sort of desperation jog, like, you know, like I'm going to get there faster even though I don't know where I'm going. And, I, and, and I'm just I'm like, where on earth did they go? And I started listening. I didn't hear anything. And where, where did they go? And then this, this sweet little, you know, grandmother type lady just kind of comes, comes around the corner from the Mexican restaurant. It's walking toward me. And I, at this point, I'm just desperate. I, I just, I, I walk up to her and I said, excuse me, ma'am, I'm looking for the church. I'm, I'm trying to find my mission group. And she goes, uh, no hablo inglés. And, and I know that I am definitely no habla espanol, hablo espanol. I was like, oh, no, what am I going to do? I, it's like I, I, so I dug deep into my, into my Spanish vocabulary. I remembered two words. I don't know if there's two or three words, but I remember two things, and I thought maybe this will work. And I just said, iglesia, por favor, I mean, you know, church, please. And then I gave her this really soulful look, like that puppy dog look, like, like, like please, please. Help me. And there, was, <laughs> there were just a couple of ticks on the clock where she kind of looked at me. I mean, here I was, this middle-aged, short, dehydrated gringo with a backpack standing on the side of the road trying to apparently say something about the church. And she looked at me and she said, and she didn't say anything, she just sort of gestured and had me follow her. So I was, okay. So, and, and, you know, I thought, you know, this is really a big risk on her part. And it's kind of a risk on my part. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. I'm pretty sure I could take her, but I don't know. <laughs> and we're going, and so, and so she takes us, she takes me down about, about half a block. And then she starts walking towards this tire store. And I'm thinking, oh no, this is, this is how it starts in the movies. <laughs> so we're walking towards the tire store and I'm, I'm thinking, okay. And I look and, and she, and she walks right into the office of the tire store. And all I see in there are the stacks of tires in the tire store and, and a little refrigerator. And I'm like, uh oh, this is, this isn't good. And then I, and then I finally heard it. I heard voices. I think I heard in a couple of the kids voices that I recognized. And she went through this door and through this curtain and there in one of the back rooms of the, of the tire store, was a group of people gathered. There was a little drum set in there, and there was a keyboard and a little makeshift pulpit that they had made out of a, um, made out of a rolling toolbox. And the best thing was they had a couple of air conditioning units in there. So it was, so there finally, so finally I had found the church. And, you know, it was, it was, it was very, it was very uh, calming to finally see familiar faces. But, you know, but there I was, you know, I, I've, I was out there on the street all by myself, and I never would have found the church if, if it hadn't been for her. I was lost, and I was abandoned. I couldn't find the church on my own, and yet I was right outside of this tire store church. 
where there was water, where there was food, where there was air conditioning, where there was a bathroom, where there was music and truth and people who knew me and cared about me. And it was all right there. It was within 20 yards of me, but I couldn't see it. I, but, and I still needed someone to lead me there. I needed someone to show me the way. You know, that's the pattern that we see in our scripture lesson that Emily read today. John the Baptist showed his two disciples the Son of God, Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. And John helped Andrew find the person who loved him and would change his life forever. And then Andrew helped his brother Peter find the person who would change his life forever. He told Peter, we have found the Messiah. And then he took him to Jesus. And then we know what happened. Peter became one of the men, along with his father, one of the people, uh, excuse me, along with his brother Andrew, that led the world to Christ and changed the world forever. But in each case, there's a pattern. Somebody leads somebody else to Jesus Christ. And that's what I want you to think about this morning. How are we helping people find their way to the person who can change their lives forever? How are we helping people find Jesus? So I got into that tire store, and in that tire store, we had come to the home of Iglesias Missionera Cristo Viva, which I think means Mission Church of the Living Christ. But there they were. And one of the real highlights of the trip was the experience of worship. Even though the singing was in Spanish and the prayers and the preaching were primarily in Spanish, the Spirit of the Lord was moving in the back of that tire store. I mean, this was church in a completely and an exciting way that we had never experienced before. You know, and I want to say this about the congregation. There are not enough words in either Spanish or English to describe the generosity of the people we met. I mean, this is a church that has so little. It's not even as big as one of our sections of seating here. I mean, and even fewer people. And here is a church that was praying that God would help them give away even more than they were giving away. And they had very little to begin with. But that is what we saw there. The pastor's name was Hugo Moya. And he started with Deuteronomy 4.29. This is what he said. This is what he read. Excuse me. You will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him, if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Pastor Hugo's sermon that night was all about seeking Jesus. He said that everyone is looking for something, but they're not going to find what they need until they understand that what they need is the love and the power and the truth of Jesus Christ. So he kept saying over and over again, busca Jesus, seek Jesus, over and over again. And as I listened to Pastor Hugo's sermon, I was amused at how ironically appropriate it was that we would spend the first night of our mission trip worshiping Jesus Christ in a tire store. It's appropriate to have church in a tire store because everywhere you look, you are reminded that this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> it is in seeking Jesus and helping people to find Jesus. Because he also reminded us that it's not enough for, enough for us to tell people to seek Jesus. We also have to help people to find Jesus. Romans 10, 14 says this, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear unless someone is sent? How are they going to know? Where, wherever our mission is concerned, whether it's in McAllen or San Antonio or Alaska or some other place around the world, this is where the rubber meets the road. 
And that's what Pastor Hugo's tiny church does every day. They share the gospel and they give Bibles to people sleeping in that no man's land between checkpoints on the U.S. and Mexican border. They provide food for refugee shelters. They distribute food to the elderly and unemployed and disabled people living in those border communities. And they pray and they share the gospel with some of the most desperate people that you will ever meet. And we had the privilege of joining them in that work. Our first work site was a ministry called Border Missions. And this is an old ministry, about 60 years old, that has served the border communities for six decades. In addition to holding large church services and providing emergency care, uh, much like our own CAM, it's a lot like CAM, Border Missions operates an active food bank. And we spent our first morning loading boxes of food and crates of vegetables into pickup trucks and trailers and vans and SUVs and hatchbacks. And our team members packaged beans and rice and probably over a million Cheez-It crackers. I mean, how many of you all, have y'all touched a Cheez-It since you've been home? You have. Good for you. All right. Well, I mean, but that's, that was part of it. But that was, that was a pretty messy way to, to engage with people to show them the love of Jesus Christ. On our first and second afternoons, our team held a kids club for the neighborhood children where we sang together, did crafts, we played games, enjoyed making new friends, but shared the gospel, shared the love of Jesus with those neighborhood kids. We also served for several days with the Rio Grande Valley Food Bank. And there we, we packaged literally pallets full of food, everything from apple juice to, to canned salmon, from rice to condensed milk. And you know, we had the tremendous opportunity and joy to give those bags, those those supply bags and boxes directly to the people who needed them. Because for two days, we were deployed to distribution sites around the county. The food bank would send out word that there was a food distribution taking place at a county park or a, a rec center or something like that. And the cars would line up, sometimes 100 cars at a time. And our, t- our team would load these huge 50-pound bags and packed boxes of dry goods into their cars. You know, some, some cars would just get two bags and, a, and two boxes, but occasionally we'd have as many as five. At one point, this van from a senior center drove up. And the lady handed me this handful of tickets. And it was just a clump of tickets. And she said... 34. And I looked at my team. And I went around the corner. I looked at my team and I said, okay, we've got a 34. And you know what? Those, those kids and Julie, they, 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 just, they didn't say a thing. They just said, okay, and started putting them together. Not a word of complaint. The only word I heard them say over and over again, and forgive my pronunciation, Dios bendigo. God bless you. I heard those kids and our leaders say that over a thousand times, literally. You know, one of the most challenging but inspiring experiences came on the day that the food bank received this wonderful but unexpected delivery of produce. Two tractor trailers worth of produce came into the food bank, and the food bank had no place to store them. They would either have to to give the food away or it would spoil and go to waste. And so they moved our kids off of the packing assembly line and out into the parking lot to begin moving produce and putting it directly into people's cars. And I don't know if you've ever worked with truckloads of produce before. Sometimes it can get pretty gross. For every 10 boxes or cartons of good mangoes, You find several bad ones, and there is nothing more putrid than a spoiled crate of peppers or cilantro or mangoes or tomatoes. I have clothes that will forever smell like cilantro because of this day. It didn't matter. We were all inspired because here was all this food, and it had been given. All this food had been given just so that we would have the privilege of giving it away. It was given so that we could give it to the people who needed it. You know, it wasn't food that we had bought. It wasn't food that we had planted or grown or harvested. It was food that was given to us so that we could give it away. 
But you know what? Here's the interesting thing. This, this was not an expected shipment. The, the word had not gotten out through the normal channels. And so we had to let people know that all of this food was, was here. Otherwise, it would go to waste, and the people who needed it would go hungry. And so the food bank used social media, and they announced it in, on TV and in the newspaper and on the radio. But here was the coolest thing. The coolest thing was, was seeing some volunteers standing out on the road, on the highway, in a million-degree heat, waving handmade signs that said, free produce, come and get it. Just, I mean, and it's kind of like, you know, those guys at the tax places, kind of like they're spinning it around. These, they were so enthusiastic. We have something you need, and it's here for the taking. Just come get it. Please come get this food. Please come get it, because we know you need it, and we want to give it to you. They were giving their time so that people who needed food would know where to find it. it reminds me of what the Scripture says, all who are thirsty... All who are hungry, come by and eat. That one thing reminded me of this, that the mission of the church, the mission of evangelism, is not perfect people telling imperfect people to shape up. The mission of the church is one hungry person telling another hungry person where he found food. It had been given to us, and we just got to tell people to come and get it. The mission of the church is to lead people to Jesus Christ because He has what we need, He is what they need. This is where the rubber hits the road. Jesus is saying, go and find them, go and tell them, go and get them, go and bring them. You know, when I couldn't find the church, I was lost. I needed someone to lead me there. I couldn't get there by myself. Sometimes serving Jesus starts with helping people find their way to Him. And sometimes it also means helping them find their way out of whatever mess they're already in. Because you know what? There are lots of people who are lost to Christ, who are lost to one another, who are lost in the broken systems and wilderness of this world. You know what? I am one of the other adults uh, on the trip had the opportunity to visit a church-sponsored immigrant refugee facility in McAllen. The center was totally overwhelmed by people coming through after having passed through immigration. And I would say that the center was probably designed to care for about 100 people a day. But when we were there, there were well over 1,000 people. Families, men, women, children, infants, the elderly. I have been to refugee camps in the third world in sub-Saharan Africa. But this was about as bad as it gets. It is a crisis. But here's the, the question that, that I kept asking the people there, and I just kept asking myself, what's next for these people? They couldn't, they couldn't stay in this place long term. What's next for them? They don't know where to go. They don't know where to get help. They don't even speak the language. They have been lost. They are lost and abandoned on the side of life's road. And they don't know where to go, and they don't know what their next step is. Who's going to help them find the way? You know, it's like so many people, they don't know where to go next. They don't know what Christ offers. They need someone to help them find the way. Because here's the truth of it. Everyone is hungry. They're hungry for food or they're hungry for something else. For everything else. For peace, for relationships, for purpose. And yet without even knowing it, they are hungry for a relationship with the God who loves them. You know, one of the most interesting things that I learned working in 105 degree heat this week is that I learned what dehydration really feels like. In spite of Becky telling us all the time, drink water, drink water, drink water, you get to the point where you just can't drink water fast enough. And, and what was interesting is that when you're dehydrated, you don't really feel thirsty. 
You're actually way past that. Instead, you feel weak and you feel sick. You need water, but that's not what it feels like. People are dehydrated. They're dehydrated in their bodies. They're dehydrated in their souls. But they don't know about the living water of Jesus Christ. And they're not going to know about it. Unless we lead them there. Again, follow me. One hungry person telling another hungry person where he found food. One thirsty person telling another thirsty person where she found water. We have found the Messiah. We have found the person who loves you so much that he gave his life on the cross to prove it and who raised him from the dead to prove that he has the power to make a difference in your life. You know, but if that sweet sister hadn't led me to the tire store, I would have been really hot and really lost and really angry. But she took a risk. I mean, again, here was this strange-looking, dehydrated, tired, middle-aged gringo on the side of the road with a backpack on his back who didn't speak Spanish, and what he spoke had a really vicious southern accent. She had no idea who I was or what I was doing there. She just knew that I was lost and I was trying to find the church and she had mercy enough to lead me. And if she hadn't led me into that tire store to the church, I would have never found it on my own. I would have looked and looked and looked and never gotten there. I needed someone to lead me there. John the Baptist knew that Andrew needed Jesus. Andrew knew that his brother Peter was looking for someone who would love him and make a difference in his life. And Peter knew that the world, all of us, need a Savior, even if we don't realize it ourselves. This is where the rubber meets the road. What are you doing? What am I doing? What are we doing to help people find Jesus? Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, there are so many people in this world who are lost. They are lost to you. They are lost in their relationships with other people. They are lost in the systems and gears of this world. And Lord, it's not just people in the world. There are people in this room who are spiritually dehydrated, who are thirsty but don't even know for what, who are hungry but don't even know what it is that's going to satisfy their hunger or slake their thirst. Lord, they don't know about your truth and about your power. They don't know about your love. Lord, give us a burden to help them find Christ. Make us like that sweet lady who took a stranger and showed him the church where he would never know it existed. Lord, help us to be that person who will lead the people who are hungry and thirsty to you. Amen.